Stephen Kunis, and we're live at Woodlawn Cemetery in Elmira, New York, location of the final resting spot of Mr. Samuel Clemens, otherwise known as Mark Twain, for this week's episode of Over My Dead Body. First things first, do you prefer Clemens or Twain? Take a wild f***ing guess. Well, the inscription says both. My, aren't we observant. Also, what's up with the roses? Women leave them. They stand there and cry while I look up their dress. Last week it was a bus tour from New Jersey. At least they make it a point to visit. I'd rather they stayed home. Really? I don't like people much. Why is that, sir? Where should I start? The remarkable, irascible Mark Twain coming right up. Think you know a lot about Mark Twain? Think again. Twain is everywhere, from literature to popular culture. As one of the greatest American authors and humorists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, he is undeniably the father of American literature. Yet, he was also an inventor, steamboat pilot, prospector, and militiaman, as well as a snarky satirist and cutting-edge commentator on humanity and American life. While he is best known for his classic, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Twain's body of work is expansive. His unique philosophy reveals deep issues, from freedom and human rights to science, slavery, and religion. Yet, for someone who makes millions laugh, his life was also filled with a dark sadness. So, let's meet the great writer and adventurer extraordinaire. Mr. Mark Twain, welcome to Over My Dead Body. Good morning, sir. What's good about it? Did we wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I came up with a great title for my new book. It's called Humans Suck. Why is that? Most people choose to help others because of the personal benefits that they themselves expect to obtain. So, you don't believe in charity? Good Lord, yes, my man, but she did nothing for free, if you catch my drift. Did you not pay for a former slave to attend three years of law school at Yale? It was the least I could do for the man, considering what he had gone through. Do you perchance have a smoke, sir? Cigars are hard to come by around here. No, I'm sorry about that. I must say your grave is remarkable. Twelve feet tall or two fathoms, a measure riverboat captains would call out as Mark Twain. Very clever. Some weirdo with a man crush used a ladder and stole it once. They nabbed him a few days later, and the judge sentenced him to 30 days in jail, where he had to give head the whole time, otherwise known as hard labor. You may be interested to know that on July 4th, 2003, Hannibal, Missouri, dedicated a statue to you which paid tribute to your career as a steamboat pilot on the Mississippi River. I wouldn't exactly call it a career. Well, you certainly made a name for yourself. From your experience as a steamboat pilot, the term Mark Twain means it is safe to sail. It's also a metaphor for life. Everybody has a certain depth to them, or limit, per se. You, for example, seem a bit shallow. Thanks. You often drew from your life in your writings. I'm sure our audience is excited to know a little about you, Mr. Twain. Sure, what the hell. I was born Samuel Langhorn Clemens on November 30th, 1835, in the town of Florida, Missouri, two weeks after Halley's Comet appeared in its closest approach to the Earth. I'm sure some cosmic dust affected my mental capabilities after that. I was one of seven children and the second-to-last child born. 
Unfortunately, my brothers Orion, Henry, and Sister Pamela were the only ones who survived. My father, John Marshall Clemens, worked as a Tennessee country merchant, a lawyer, then a judge. My mother was Jane Lampton Clemens, a great mother. You were a pretty sickly child. Your mother worried you might not make it. Incorrect, sir. She was worried I would make it. Okay. In 1839, when you were four, your father moved the family to Hannibal, Missouri, a town by the Mississippi River. This changed your life, right? Certainly did. It was on the banks of the Mississippi River that I reveled in life along a river busy with steamboat activity and other pleasures. I often traveled in makeshift rafts or cavorted in various swimming holes where I spied on girls and played with myself. Not to mention, a cave nearby offered me further opportunity for exploration and adventure. In fact, it was in the cave I explored the voluptuous body of the town whore and got laid for the first time. But your childhood was not entirely one of carefree play. Your father faltered with various business speculations. When he died in 1847 of pneumonia, you were only 12 years old and were forced to quit school to help support your family. I went to work as a typesetter for Orion, who owned several newspapers, one of which was the Hannibal Journal. I also began writing under the pseudonym SLC. What does SLC stand for? You would never win on Jeopardy. Do you consider yourself a self-taught writer? Even though I didn't finish school, I came to learn that no matter where I went in life, I could still educate myself by life experiences and by reading at the library. Writing came naturally. From the ages of 18 to 22, you worked as a printer, traveling from Missouri to New York, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and St. Louis. What came next? In 1857, I stopped writing when I was in St. Louis because I was fascinated with riverboating. Then I became a steamboat pilot after befriending Horace E. Bixby, a master pilot. He made me memorize over 2,000 miles of riverbed. He also made me retrieve things from his pants pocket while we were sailing because his hands were on the wheel. He also kept asking me if I'd ever seen a grown man naked. Not sure what that had to do with steamboating. Did you not get your brother Henry a job on the same boat you were on? Yes, the Pennsylvania. Why bring that up? Because what happened there seriously affected you. Just because he got blown up by a boiler when I was off the ship engaging in some irreverent occupation doesn't mean squat. So, Mr. Twain... Soon the river trade was effectively stopped by the Civil War, and you traveled to Nevada at the height of the Silver Rush. Yeah, that war screwed everything up, so I thought it best to head west. Didn't you join a Confederate militia before leaving? Not proud of it. In fact, did you not hightail it and run when Grant was headed toward your town? I prefer the word disbanded. In Nevada, you started writing again this time using Mark Twain for the first time. I found work at a local newspaper and used other pseudonyms such as Thomas Jefferson Snodgrass. Why use another name? Why not? Haven't you ever wanted to remain anonymous? Shoot, I was doing so much scandalous shenanigans, figured it was the best way to not be named as the father. Speaking of shenanigans... Isn't the real reason you use pseudonyms is that you got in a bit of trouble out there? My mouth got me into a duel with this other newspaper man who was a complete moron. Never get into a battle of wits over religion or politics with an unarmed man. What happened? Well, he was soon armed with a big pistol, too. <laughs> so I once again hightailed out of there to San Francisco, where I landed a job as a reporter. But that didn't last long. I had to hightail it out of there, too. Something about owing a bond for a buddy who skipped out on his court appearance for fighting in a bar. Ended up at Jackass Hill, an aptly named mining town. Turned out to be a fortuitous event. Wasn't it there where you wrote your famous story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County? 
Actually, I totally ripped that story off a guy in a bar after overhearing him tell it to a bunch of drunk dummies. The published title isn't the real title either. What was the real title? From Frog's Legs to Spread Legs. There were no ladies in that town, if you catch my drift. Well, it was your first claim to fame. It became an instant success and made you famous. It also got you a job writing travelogues. The first one in Hawaii. Where the hell is Hawaii? Back then they were called the Sandwich Islands. Oh yes, good memories there. On my first day walking the beach, I came across some young ladies swimming naked in the ocean. That must have been a shock. Not really. I just sat down on their clothes and waited for them to come ashore. I tell you, those island girls are loads of fun. Pun intended. Still, to this day, I can smell the coconut oil. The following year, you traveled to the Mediterranean, Europe, and the Middle East. Your experiences led to the book Innocence Abroad. I had abroad in every country, and they weren't so innocent. It was a very popular book. Sex sells, or the hinting at it. In any event, it kept my editor busy. Your travels led you to meet your wife, Olivia, the daughter of a very wealthy New York coal merchant. You married her and then settled in Hartford, Connecticut, where you continued to write. Best advice I could ever give a writer. Marry into money. In 1875, your novel Tom Sawyer was published, followed by Life on the Mississippi in 1883, and then your masterpiece, Huckleberry Finn, in 1885. Seems like marriage was good for you. I gave Olivia the nickname Frog Legs, if you catch my meaning. <laughs> we were married 34 years. I read she died in Italy. Thanks for reminding me, asshole. We had a spaghetti bolognese dinner and split a cannoli. Then she said to the waiter, What a great meal! And dropped dead. We returned on the same ship, but not in the same cabin. From that point on, your work, while still humorous, grew distinctly darker. Funny how that happens. Yet, despite your numerous setbacks, you wrote a total of 28 books, along with essays, articles, and short stories over your lifetime. How were you so prolific? Cocaine was legal. You once wrote that 20 years from now you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did. Do you still feel this way? Good God, yes, my man. I am still upset I never got to screw Maud Adams. The famous Broadway actress? Or Sarah Bernhardt, or Ethel Barrymore, or... You may be interested to know, since you are known as a humorist, satirist, and social commentator, an award for comedy called the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor is now given to people who have had an impact on American society like you. Is that so? Anybody interesting win the thing? Well, to name a few... Richard Pryor, Jonathan Winters, George Carlin, Bill Cosby, and Ellen DeGeneres. What's so great about them? They're a crackhead, a lunatic, a drunk, a rapist, and a lesbian. In that order. Sounds about right, but I'm not sure what a crackhead is. Think cocaine, only smoked. You may also be interested to know, sir, that Ernest Hemingway... One of the greatest modern American authors gave you a great tribute when he said, All modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. What happened to him? He blew his head off with a shotgun. <laughs> That's one way not to finish a novel. Who? Also, in 1976, an asteroid was named after you. 2362 Mark Twain. Should have been a comet. So, let's talk a bit about that famous book. Set in the antebellum South, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is more than the story of a young misfit who floats down the Mississippi River on a boat with Jim, a runaway slave. You must have a Ph.D. in obviousness. The inspiration for Huck Finn was Tom Blankenship, a boy four years older than me who I knew growing up in Hannibal. Blankenship's family was poor, and his father, a laborer, had a reputation as the town drunk who beat Tom silly. 
so much of it was based on people and events? Well, in Huckleberry Finn, I drew Tom Blankenship exactly as he was. He was ignorant, unwashed, insufficiently fed, but he had a good heart as any boy ever had. I don't know what happened to him, though. I heard a rumor he became a justice of the peace in Montana, yet other rumors say he was jailed for theft or died of cholera. What is certain is that Adventures of Huckleberry Finn has been controversial. Just a month after its American release in 1885, it was banned by the public library in Concord, Massachusetts, for its supposedly coarse language and low moral tone. You know, the folks who brought us the Salem witch trials got no place talking low moral tone this or that. They can stick a pitchfork in their asses for all I care and twist it up there good. In the mid-20th century, critics began condemning the book as racist, and in the ensuing decades it was removed from some school reading lists. So much for the evolution of our species. You began the book with the preface, Persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find a moral in it will be banished. Persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot. Why? My books are like water. Those of the great geniuses are wine. Fortunately, everybody drinks water. After becoming a successful writer, you sunk money into a number of bad investments and eventually went bankrupt. One investing debacle involved an automatic typesetting machine. In 1874, I spotted one of the first typewriters, a Remington, in a Boston store window. Although it could only type capital letters and I had to operate the carriage return with a foot pedal, I bought it for $125. It was a piece of shit. But I wrote the first porn in America written on a typewriter. <laughs> Seriously? Hell yes! Took me ten minutes to write faster, harder, and deeper. Conversely, when offered the chance to invest in the telephone, you reportedly turned down its inventor, Alexander Graham Bell. It was a stupid invention. Who wants to talk to people all the time? And you invented as well, including a self-pasting scrapbook, which sold well and an elastic strap for pants, which didn't. Win some, lose some. How come nobody mentions the dildo? Notwithstanding, in 1894 you declared bankruptcy. But then, the next year, you embarked on an around-the-world speaking tour in order to pay off your debts. Which I was able to do within several years. People loved hearing my stories about masturbation. I'm not going to touch that. Nice. You know, the monkey is the only animal except man that practices this science. Hence, he is our brother. Before the show, my producer told me that Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of the famous anti-slavery book Uncle Tom's Cabin, was your next-door neighbor in Hartford. Is that true? Unfortunately, yes. What was she like? She was a bitch. Her dog kept crapping in my yard and chasing my cats, and she had a problem with my house, especially the gun turrets. Not sure why. I designed that house myself. Also, her book sucks. Who is Laura Hawkins Fraser? She was the inspiration for Becky Thatcher. She was also the inspiration for numerous cave rompings. <laughs> you were childhood sweethearts, right? She was one of many. I'd say more tangy than sweet. Would you care to take a call, Mr. Twain? If I must. Christine from Red Bank, New Jersey. Say hello to Mark Twain. Oh, Mr. Twain. Mr. Twain, are you any of your characters? Well, now, I am all of them and none. That's a contradiction. My, my, such big words for a little girl. I'm 65, you asshole. And a feisty 65 at that. I like you already. I'll bet you kick up quite a storm in the rack. You're damn straight. You know, Mr. Twain, you said something that has stuck with me my entire life. You said the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Well, it's true. 
So, I'm wondering, why were you bored? To pull your grandmother's pants down. Eat me. Yum, yum. Let's try this again. Darren from Santa Barbara, California. Meet Mr. Mark Twain. Hi, Mr. Twain. I'm wondering, what do you think of our sense of humor in America today? What sense of humor? That's what I figured. Actually, you might be surprised to know, I think America has made great strides in the humor department and just doesn't know it. How's that? Well, today a man can call himself a woman and people won't bat an eyelash. But if he identifies as a woman? What the hell does that mean? No man has the slightest clue what it is to be a woman. What's this identity hogwash? Hey, I have a riddle for you. Go ahead. What do you get when you take a man, pump him full of estrogen, give him breast implants and a long wig, put him in an evening gown and chop off his dick? I give up. You get a guy with estrogen, implants, a wig, a dress, and no dick. So you don't buy the men and women's sports thing? Maybe when LeBron James puts on lipstick and joins the WBA, I'll consider it. Okay, we have a letter from a history professor, William Longyard, from Virginia. He'd like to get your take on a few current events. Sure. Woke culture. Oh, that's a con where you try to convince somebody that they were asleep all along and whatever they think they've experienced never really happened. Uh, Bill Cosby invented it. It's a criminal defense attorney's wet dream. Cancel culture. Same thing. If you don't like something, it never happened. A divorce lawyer's wet dream. Poof, it's gone. Are you aware that there was once an American actor named Hal Holbrook who spent several decades of his life traveling around the world doing a one-man show where he pretended to be you? Don't get me started. The guy wore a white suit and pontificated about life using my name. A total blowhard. It used to really piss me off until I returned the favor. How's that? I performed my own one-man show as Hal Holbrook. Would you care for a sample? I'm all ears. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my one-man show. My name is Hal Holbrook, and I claim to be an actor. The reason I pursued a career in the arts is simple. I'm dumb as a cowbell, have no discernible skills, and I smell like I slept under a park bench. How's that for an opening? It's catchy for sure. So I escaped into the world of make-believe. I pretend I'm an actor. I pretend I'm a famous writer named Mark Twain. And I pretend I have a big dick, when truth be told. I'm no actor, I'm no writer, and the only words a woman has ever shouted to me are, Is it in yet? (laughs) Moving on. Delia, a high school teacher from Newtown, Pennsylvania. What's your question? Good afternoon, Mr. Twain. I have two questions. What do you think of today's authors, and did you really write in bed? First answer. There are no authors worth reading today. And yes, I wrote most of my books in bed. That's where my best thinking happened. So rather than run across a cold, dark room to my desk and break a little toe for the seventh time, I just kept a pencil and paper on the nightstand next to the lubricant. I read that in 1907, three years before you died, you received an honorary degree from Oxford and were so proud of the robe they gave you at graduation, you wore it to your daughter's wedding. Tell me that can't be true. Let's just say we looked like two brides walking down the aisle. Okay, our final caller is Brian from Sandusky, Ohio. What's your question for Mark Twain? First of all, I'd like to thank you for the wonderful book you left the world. You're welcome. Are you really from Sandusky? Yes, I am. It must suck to live in a town with the same name as a convicted child molester. It hasn't helped property values. But I guess things could be worse. Yeah, maybe Hitler, Idaho, or Mussolini, Montana. Or live on Ted Bundy Avenue. How about Harvey Weinstein's circle? I think this is the start of a beautiful friendship. Cunnilingus, Mississippi. Smegma, Wyoming. (laughs) 
I think you might have found a long-lost son, so to speak. Could be. Speaking of descendants, your only surviving child, Clara, died in 1962 at age 88. Clara Clemens had one child, Nina, who passed away in 1966, but she was childless. So there are no direct descendants of you alive today. Thanks for the update, douchebag. You predicted that you would die when Haley's Comet returned. I came in with Haley's Comet, and I expected to go out with it. I died on April 21st, 1910, and Haley's Comet was once again visible in the sky. Any last words, Mr. Twain? I'm glad I'm dead. And we're glad you took the time to come on our show. That's the story from Elmira, New York. We'll see you again soon on the next episode of Over My Dead Body. We hope you enjoyed the ninth episode of Over My Dead Body. The entire TV series is now available as a podcast in addition to streaming on Amazon Prime. Aside from Mark Twain, we've interviewed Robert Kardashian, Nostradamus, Steve Jobs, Mae West, Richard Nixon, Julia Child, Tupac Shakur, and Phyllis Diller. Upcoming guests include Howard Cosell, Walter Cronkite, Sigmund Freud, Jimmy Stewart, Albert Einstein, Jack Lemmon, Lucille Ball, and Red Fox. All told, we plan to produce 60 episodes and perhaps as many as 300 of them. One thing's for certain, there's no shortage of interesting guests and more seem to arrive every day. I'm Stephen Kunis and I created Over My Dead Body, serve as the executive producer, and research and write each episode. Mark Twain was portrayed by Frank Gerard, a man of many talents and voices. Very special thanks go to Norman Lear for his encouragement in the development of this show, and to the late, great Johnny Carson for suggesting that a talk show with a fantasy guest list would be a wonderful idea. 